Hello, Brittany Jackson here today to focus on the very non-scary universal design for learning, specifically the engagement aspect of UDL. This presentation is from one of three UDL workshops offered to Hiram College faculty in the spring of 2018, where I presented on each of the three tenets of UDL, action and expression, representation, and engagement. This particular presentation focuses on engagement. So what is UDL? According to the Center for Applied Special Technology, or CAS, UDL is a research-based set of principles to guide the design of learning environments that are accessible and effective for all. So UDL began in the 1990s based on the original model of universal design that focused specifically on physical accessibility, more specifically for those with mobility challenges. UDL focuses more on the educational environment and how to make every learning opportunity in your classroom accessible to your students, regardless of the differences they may have from each other. So there are three tenets of UDL, action and expression, representation, and engagement, which is the one we're going to focus on in this presentation. And the image here is, uh, depicts hands holding, and it reminded me of the fact that we are in this together, both the student and the instructor. You can't have one without the other, and so we need to work together to learn knowledge. I don't know about you, but quite frequently I learn quite a bit from my students, and so it's not just a one-way street from me to them. So one of the uh, tenets of engagement is recruiting interest. If you walk away with nothing else, walk away realizing that if information is presented that students don't engage with, it's inaccessible. I think we frequ frequently only think about accessibility from the lens of disability, but if the student is not engaged with the lesson, they're not going to try and access the information and therefore it's inaccessible. So one way to work on this is to learn about your students. The more you learn about the, their interests, the more likely you are to engage them. If you provide them with autonomy, they're going to engage and listen more closely because they feel heard. So this next one seems a little scary to some faculty and definitely freaks out the students, but let the students design the activities and tasks. They're more likely to retain the information if they have a voice in how they learn the information. And ask your students to set their own personal goals. Again, this is all about engaging them in the process. And then vary activities and where you are pulling your sources from because students each come with their own personal history and one thing might turn a student off from learning, but another might really engage them. If they have options and a variety of ways to access the material, they will likely engage and find a good fit for themselves. Creating activities that are authentic is important because if it feels forced in the classroom, your stu students are going to pick up on that immediately. Students should be provided the opportunities for participation, exploration, and experimentation in the activities for the class. If they have to just constantly sit there and hear a lecture, they're going to disengage very quickly. So the image here depicts a thumb lightly touching the top of a man's head, and I like to think of this as sort of taking the knowledge pulse. Is your class engaged? How can you tell? Um, so it's important to allow time for students to reflect and respond to the course content. If you're just jumping all over the board, students are going to disengage really quickly. And then make the real or make the activity real world applicable. Think outside the box. Be creative. Ha have your students also think through creative solutions to the real world problems. It means they, they feel like they're going to be able to make a difference. So all students should feel accepted and supported in your classroom. An easy way to do this is to start the first class by going around with introductions and ask for preferred pronouns. This will give students a chance to be acknowledged for who they are, not just for who we think they are. And then always think about the social demands of the lesson um, and provide opportunities for self-reflection. For introverts, it can be very tiring to constantly be having discussions when they are just trying to absorb the information. If you build in time for reflection, um, you'll meet the students and other students' needs. So this is one we don't always consider. Sensory stimulation. So what is some sensory stimulation? So it's anything that interferes with your sense of taste, smell, touch, sight, and hearing, right? So think about what it is that's happening in your classroom. Could the light or projector be emitting sounds that you aren't likely to hear, but someone with more sensitive hearing might be hugely distracted by? And if so, break up the lesson in a way that allows students to move away from that sound if possible. 
And if you're having students do something completely new or foreign to them, don't put all the new things in one lesson or you're going to overwhelm them. Charts and schedules and class routines can also help alleviate this issue. Another tenet of engagement is sustaining effort and persistence. So here you want to remind students of what they're working towards. If you don't mention a final project for several weeks, students may forget why they're doing the work you're asking them to do. I think of this sort of like the image here that shows an air, airport flight screen and it tells you when the departures and arrivals are coming in and at what times. Um, any change should be talked through with the students. Have students look at the goals of the class and put them in their own language. Then you can see if they understand what they're working towards. And there should be a variety of ways um, goals could be displayed. The importance is to not just have one medium that does this, but several ways of discussing the goals. And then of course, break down larger goals into short-term goals. If you're using tools in your class, be sure you demonstrate how to use them. Don't assume your students are tech savvy in every aspect because they may not know how to use every software available. You've heard it here again and again in these presentations, but I'm going to say it yet again. Scaffold, scaffold, scaffold. Build upon the concepts that students already know, and that will help keep them engaged. Always provide examples of what would be considered excellent work in a rubric so students know what they need to do for certain grades. Also talk about the topics relevant to their, uh, relevant to their interests. And remember that every student is different. In the autism world, we say if you know one person with autism, you know one person with autism. And the same is true for each and every student you have. Each person has their own likes and dislikes. And I thought this image um, was quite appropriate with one person's head representing fire and the other person's head's head representing water. Within the same class, you may have one person who is in love with the topic and another person you're going to have to coach through that topic. And each student is different, so don't expect them all to learn the same way which leads uh, us to considering alternative assignments. One person might be really creative and can demonstrate a chemistry concept in an art form, while another student is very analytical and re would prefer to present it in either a presentation or in a paper. And provi by providing them the options, students might be able to better present their knowledge. And then consider what's acceptable from each student, because again, each student is different. Sometimes recognizing that one student struggled to understand certain concepts but worked really hard to understand can make a difference between a B and a C when grading. Consider the amount of work each student has to put in to grasp the concept. For some, it'll come really easily, and for others, they're going to struggle with every single aspect. But take this into consideration, because sometimes effort can make all the difference. We always want to challenge our students, and in some of our lower level courses, especially those outside a student's comfort zone, students may struggle with the topic at hand, while others who love this particular topic are thriving. So be sure to meet each student where they're at. And create a cooperative learning group and play on students' strengths to create excellent working and learning environments. Always remind your students, and not just in the first class, that it, there are resources available to them. Can they go to tutoring? Is there a student who's doing well who might be willing to work with someone who's struggling? Those are great resume building skills for, for that student. And sometimes grouping students by interest will engage them in the group work. The photo here of a man sitting in a group playing a drum and another person playing a tambourine shows how people need to work together to achieve a common goal. And in this case, in the picture, it's music. If students have a common interest and a common goal, they're more likely to involve themselves in the process. And again, you want to create a rubric for group work because then your expectations for the assignment will be that much clearer. Always consider your feedback. Remember, not every student is at the same level, so consider the feedback you provide and make sure it's individualized and appropriate for that student. Maybe you can point something out to them about themselves that they have not yet discovered. A great example of this for me was when I was at Hiram as, a, as an undergraduate student. And Rick Hyde pointed out to me in my capstone for my theater major that he hadn't realized until that year how organized I was. I had never realized that either, and now I capitalize it, on it and use it to my advantage. Feedback should provide each student with a way to grow or improve and should be happening regularly. Look at patterns in the student's work. Is there something they miss regularly? 
Maybe this is something to talk with them about to find out why, and then how you, you guys might work together to overcome that issue. And the final tenet in the engagement section is self-regulation. The image here of a man holding a red balloon that has an angry face on it in front of his face, squeezing it, demonstrates frustration and possibly stress. So how do we teach our students to recognize stress inside themselves? Remember, we all walk into the classroom with stress and baggage. So how can we show students how to handle that baggage when they come in? Maybe free writing at the start of each class or a one to two minute breathing or yoga exercise might help students, and guess what, you too, uh, focus on what you're about to do for that day. And remember that we have great resources here at Hiram to help our students, such as our academic services. Guide them to these resources. Stephanie is, an amendous, uh, is a tremendous resource to um, our students. And again, provide time for self-reflection. How will they know they've reached the goal if they don't think about reaching the goal or that they reached it or how they got there? Self-reflection is key. So now what happens when frustration comes to a head? Well, of course, we can talk with a student about appropriate behavior and then, of course, guide them to Dr. Kevin as a resource. Again, we have great resources here on campus, so let's point our students in the direction of them. Sometimes frustration is born out of a phobia of the topic, which ties nicely to the photo on this slide of a man pointing, clearly shocked or afraid, at something off the screen. And if the student can get to the root of their problem or their phobia, we might be able to develop strategies to help them overcome all of this. And then talk to them about how to manage stress. Um, this might help them realize that everyone deals with stress from time to time, and there are many ways to manage it. Use your own personal experiences because every single one of us deals with stress day in and day out in some way, shape, or form. If your students recognize and realize that you're human too, you're going to connect with them even further. And then sometimes it's simp as simple as showing them how they can monitor their own behavior. Sometimes we don't always realize when we are doing something unacceptable, either because we don't or can't recognize the signs in ourselves due to a disorder, or it could be something like a cultural difference. If you talk through it with the student, they might now understand and maybe even define why they behave the way they did, and you guys can work on that. And then of course, feedback, 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 scaffold, scaffold, scaffold. Those are crucial in every aspect of your classroom. And as always, here is an image of many useful apps for the Universal Design for Learning that sp focus specifically on the means of engagement. So this document with clickable links to the apps will also be available within the UDL module in the Feather Fellows Moodle workshop. And if you have questions about UDL, you can always reach out to me at jacksonb1 at hiram.edu or extension 5380. Or you can call uh, contact Lisa Veronis. She can also assist you at veronisem at hiram.edu or extension 6114. And I hope this has helped you and please check out other presentations uh, about UDL to assist you. And remember, if you're confused or having trouble accessing it, your students will too.